right, we are recording. All right, we'll get started then. Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, it's 2 p.m. on January 4th, 2022, um, and I call this meeting to order. Uh, welcome back, everyone. <laughs> it's good to see you all again. I hope uh, everyone had a chance to unplug um, and enjoy the cannabis plant without having to think about regulating it. <laughs> um, today is our first meeting of 2022. And starting next week, we're going to move our um, regular board meetings, which we've traditionally held on Fridays, uh, to Mondays at 11 a.m. in order to avoid any uh, potential conflicts with legislative testimony. Um, speaking of which, um, Bryn will be um, testifying. She's scheduled to testify later this week in both the House Appropriations Committee to discuss our budget. Um, our proposed budget, I should say, um, as well as the House Ways and Means Committee to, to discuss our proposed fee structure. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to be holding a meeting of our advisory committee, the full committee, on Thursday, January 6th, this Thursday, at 1 p.m. to discuss our upcoming uh, report to the legislature. Uh, the physical location for that meeting will be here in our office, 89 Main Street in Montpelier. And um, you can attend remotely as well um, on a link through our website, which is ccb.vermont.gov. I guess that's all the administrative details um, that I have to discuss. Um, our rules have been filed. Um, the public comment period is ongoing. And so please take a look at those and provide the board comments on those. Um, other than that, have you had a chance Kyle and Julie to review the minutes from December 21st? Yep. Yep. All right, I take a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Great. Well, um, today we're going to look at um, some tweaks to our fee structure as well as some of the um, January 15th reporting requirements. Um, and I think, Bryn, you're going to help us walk through some of those. Yep. I'll do that. So we're going to start Thank you. with the January 15th report to the legislature. Um, and I just have a few slides to queue up some of the decision points for you guys to talk about. So in addition to requiring um, the board to um, provide some, meet with some people and um, summarize some things, the legislature also required the board to um, issue recommendations on a few specific matters. Um, so I've just queued those up here for you to discuss. Um, the first one is recommendations to the legislature about whether um, they should consider adding additional types of cannabis licenses, including craft, craft cooperative license, delivery license, or a special event license. Um, and as the board is aware, this um, the the exploratory subcommittee of our advisory committee um, looked at this question at its last meeting in December um, and had a conversation about it. And this um, question of the delivery license has also come up in the context of the social equity subcommittee. Um, so I've just flagged on here that you may also want to consider talking about a social, social equity exclusivity period um, if you did want to recommend that the legislature um, adopt another type of license. All right. Um, do we want to talk about these individually right now, or is, are there uh, or are there other slides where we are going to? Yep, we can. So you can go through these one by one, or I can just pop through all three um, requirements regarding recommendations, if you'd like to do it that way. Any preference? No. no. Whatever you look like. <laughs> <laughs> We're kicking it to you. All right. Um, so why don't you go through the rest? Okay. Yeah. So the so the next slide here is a summary of um, the other types of potential future licenses that were included in the October fifteenth report to the legislature. Um, and so this will look very familiar to folks who've been paying attention. These are the co-op cultivation license, limited retail license, which would um, allow 
a portion of an existing store, like a general store, um, to be secured in order to sell a limited amount of cannabis. Um, a cottage manufacturing license, which would um, be sort of a smaller scale manufacturing license below the tier two that would allow um, small amounts of infused products to pre be produced in a person's home, for example. Um, a delivery license, um, different models there for the delivery license. Um, what was discussed in the exploratory committee was primarily a delivery license that would allow for delivery between a retail and a consumer. Um, On-site consumption license, a temporary event retail license, and then a reduced rate retail, um, which is also sometimes referred to as a direct to consumer from cultivator retail license. All right, why don't we pause here? Because this is, I think, what I thought would be a good way to prompt the conversation. So we're required to at least, at a minimum, talk about uh, craft cooperative delivery and special event. Um, that's by statute. So the co-op license to me is not something that we need to recommend. I, I don't see why it couldn't form naturally. Uh, you know, I don't think there needs to be a license type for a co-op to seek a license, a business structure that's, uh, um, that meets the kind of definition of a co-op to seek a license. So I, um, I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense for us to create a license type of co-op um, unless we want to give it special privileges. Uh, but to me, it makes things infinitely more complicated if we try and micromanage what a co-op is in a state that has a long history of the, knowing the co-op model, knowing how to utilize it. Um, and I just, to me, I think the thought was that maybe this wasn't allowed, but I think the the kind of regulations that we created would actually allow a co-op to form. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think we've probably all answered questions about co-ops in some way, shape, or form from folks that are interested in trying to figure the landscape out. And I've thought about this specific license or this ask of us for our recommendation along the lines of special privileges as it relates to uh, social equity or or something else, um, recognizing that we wrote rules, proposed rules in a way where multiple different co-ops should be able to form naturally without you know, much thought. I think, you know, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily think we need it. I think from our social equity program and the fact that you can form co-ops um, without needing a special license type means that it'll be easier for us to manage without micromanaging certain things if it's just um, available to whoever may be seeking one. I think it's better for the market to develop those things and those relationships to exist between businesses and to let that happen organically, as other Vermont co-ops have. Right. I mean, we have regulations around co-located co-ops, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that would be instructive to people that are looking to kind of share resources and, and co-locate on a single piece of property. Um, but as far as kind of a co-op that's more distributed, um, I, I just I don't see why we would want to get in the business of putting more, being more prescriptive um, than what can just happen naturally. So mm -hmm. I don't think we need to really recommend this as a distinct license type. So why don't we move on? Then? I think we're in agreement there. Yep. Well, I should say, Bryn, is there anything that you need from us as a board to further clarify those points? I don't. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, why don't we talk about delivery then? So delivery came through the, I mean, it was discussed at length in the um, social equity subcommittee as something that could be an exclusive license. Um, I think that the model that was proposed there was more of employing people within a retail, I think probably what is better for social equity applicants and allows people to stand up their own businesses is an independent delivery license. So if, if we're going to recommend this, that would be the model that I would hope that we would Go with. So did the social equity subcommittee talk about 
talk about that being exclusive to a third party or could a retailer either contract with a third party that is a social equity company or they could also have an employee that they would, would be allowed to employ as well? My recollection is the latter. So they would employ a social equity applicant to be a delivery person. I think that there are challenges with that model in terms of employment law. Um, and I, and I don't think it allows someone to stand up their own individual business. Okay. And, what, and how do we feel about that? How do you feel? Well, that's how I feel about it. <laughs> so you, want, I, you wanted the deliverer, the transporter, to be an employee of a, no. No, that's what the Social Equity Subcommittee okay. recommended. Yeah. I would prefer that it be an independent business so yeah. that instead of working for one retailer, you could then right. pick up from multiple, like Shift Shopper or any of those other sort of delivery services where you can pick up from multiple different places and deliver to multiple different places. Right. I would be in favor of that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, obviously the benefits to me for of just delivery in general outweigh the potential downsides. Certainly, you know, we have a number of towns the vast majority of towns have not opted in to retail sales at this point, um, meaning that those residents don't have access, at least close access, um, to this market. Um, certainly it's a way to low barrier to entry business um, that could really benefit uh, social equity applicants that don't have the capital to have a brick and mortar retail store. Um, yeah, I'm in, I'm in favor of delivery. Um, I think the real questions that come to my mind around delivery, and maybe we don't have to get this detailed at this time, um, relate to is the delivery tied to retail, a retail license as in can you only, can a delivery company only purchase at a retail operation or can they purchase from a wholesaler or a cultivator um, and deliver that product? Um, or, and, and then also just the, o the other question kind of is, is kind of tied to the, the whole, is this more like the ice cream truck model or the pizza model where you're, can you make aggregate, can you take aggregate orders and load up your car with as much cannabis as we allow and make multiple deliveries or do you have to kind of just do them one at a time, um, and go back and forth. I think on that, just <clears throat> the way that the landscape of our state fu fundamentally is, it would be a real challenge to have to do one individual trip mm -hmm. per one order. Just right. Right. because, you know, I know current medical dispensaries are delivering all right. over the state. And if you had that kind of requirement and somebody's going from here to Newport, here, Brattleboro, you know, that's. It doesn't make financially viable sense for somebody to enter that business as a delivery driver based off of the cost of getting from point A to point B, back to point A, back to wherever. So I, I agree with that. But then um, do we want to be prescriptive about how much product a car can have in it at any one time and for how long that is? Because then you start to blur the lines between is this a standalone retail, mobile retailer versus a actual delivery. So I think my answer to your question would be yes, we'd probably want to have some limitations. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we'd probably develop those through rule, right? right? Yeah. So the basic parameters that we agree on, I think, are that it's the transporter, the deliverer is a standalone business. Mm -hmm. There's a social equity exclusivity period mm -hmm. um, and that they have to purchase from retailers but they can kind of aggregate aggregate their aggregate their deliveries um, with some limitation on how much they can put in their car at any how much they can have at any one time and for how long you right. know, they can't have products in there for months right. Um, we might even say not overnight. I mean, it could right. be this is a day 
right. you know, within a 24 hour period, you can have this much in your car. Right. Yeah, and I think a lot of that we can mm -hmm. make up through regulation, even recognizing that you probably don't want your car having your business. I don't know, business name on it doesn't need to be an unmarked car, that type of stuff. There's right. a, there's a, we pull at the thread. And a lot of it, we could look to some of the regulations we proposed around transporting between license types. Yeah. See what makes sense, what doesn't make sense for the point of being consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything more on delivery? No. Nope. No? All right. David and Brent, is that sufficient for the report? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so next, we need to talk about special event licenses. So to me, this is a pretty important license type um, for any number of reasons. Um, one, um, we are going to be, you know, a very tourist heavy market, um, just g given the demographics of our state and what kind of our consultants kind of showed us as far as um, people that are coming to the state and uh, purchasing here. Um, to me, also, we have a booming wedding industry, ski industry. Um, we really need to, um, and, and those folks really that are coming here have no legal place to consume. Um, you know, our public air laws, our clean air laws prevent them from, you know, consuming anywhere where tobacco is prohibited, which is pretty much everywhere except outside. Um, and we have, because of the federal illegality or just because of our civil and criminal penalties, it's also prohibited to consume outside. Mm -hmm. So having um, a safe place uh, to consume, to me, is, is really essential. Um, but this, both the special event and on-site consumption, um, you know, really implicates some very serious highway safety, roadway safety concerns. Um, and so overcoming those, as well as just uh, the idea that, you know, if you're doing on-site consumption or if you're doing event-based consumption that there's also the ability for younger under 21 people to be exposed um, and employees of you know an on-site consumption place to the particular matter so there's public health concerns as well but I also think that's really critical um, to standing up an effective market really taking advantage of the folks that are coming here and stopping by Massachusetts along their way and consuming here because um, they're doing it anyway. I mean, we can't just put our heads in the sand and think that, you know, people aren't going to weddings and popping out their vape pens or, you know, smoking a joint on a chairlift or something like that. Like, we really have to kind of acknowledge that that is happening currently. Um, so I'm very much in favor of both on-site consumption and special event um, licensing. How we get there is going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. How we address the public safety, public health concerns is going to be really challenging. So we could start with special event, right, and allow retailers potentially to be the ones who add on a special event so that they have some product knowledge access. Or it could be an independent license, somebody mm -hmm. who owns a special event company. Um, and we could potentially limit it to places where we know people are staying overnight. I mean, I'm assuming, like with a liquor variant, right, like people do for events, there would be some approval process. Right. Right. I mean, the way that I envisioned special event really was um, very similar to the alcohol. Um, but I, I, you know, I tried to just tie it to a wedding because it's, it's easier to envision a wedding, you know, and it's a little bit less scary than having kind of like a Vermont Brewfest, Vermont, you know, Budfest or whatever style event um, that's just huge and um, in, you know has extreme kind of transportation considerations but you know if you just think about it in terms of a wedding yes you have a company that's all they do is go to weddings and set up a you know bar um, they are trained to spot overconsumption they're trained to spot intoxication 
they um, usually weddings have some sort of busing or overnight venue. Most people have, you know, you could have a designated driver sign up sheet, or, you know, on your way into a consumption site. And they're usually in a wedding kind of outdoors, which is also, I think, important. Um, and, uh, you know, they're usually in a venue where you could kind of put them around a corner, tuck them away from, you know, just open public view um, so that, you know, you're not exposing, you know, people under 21 to consumption. I actually see it a little differently. Like, it might be better to start with professional conventions. So if there are cannabis conventions or gatherings of cannabis professionals, mm -hmm. because they will have experience with consumption or more likely to. Whereas at weddings, people tend to, um, I don't know, they let loose in, a, in the course of five hours because they're having a good time, right? So they're maybe less experienced consumers and mm -hmm. I think we might actually run into more problems. but. I mean, I would be fine with starting with a cannabis convention, allowing an on-site consumption starting there um, and expanding it from there. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not actually opposed to that. Yeah. I'm just trying to, you know, people understand a cash bar or an open yeah. bar at a wedding, and this would be kind of taking that model and tweaking it and kind of adding some additional safety rails, safety guardrails around it. But yeah, I, I wouldn't say that if we did this, it would be limited to wedding venues or wedding events. I just, I think it's, it's easier for me to kind of grasp the concept if I tie it to an event in my head. Yeah, um, but yeah I agree with both of you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a place for on-site consumption here and, and special event licenses. I kind of like, you know, um, a lot of what you, what you both said. I think I recognize that there is some of those types of events in Vermont and New England that those people will be well inclined to be able to do something like this. I actually like the idea of not limiting it to retail establishments, but they're going to have to understand a lot of those security impacts just like, you know, for selling at retail versus hosting an on-site consumption. So I like that as an option. I'm not in favor of strictly limiting it to folks with a retail license. Um, I'm also wondering if we can do anything in the social equity context to give folks an opportunity to host on-site consumption temporary mm -hmm. permits from a social equity applicant perspective. Um, I'm throwing ideas out there. We could do an exclusivity period just like with delivery. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm, in, I'm in favor of, uh, I want, I understand starting, as you said, with those professionals that understand the industry but it might be harder for other folks to learn if we're mm -hmm. starting just there. So I want, you know, we've got to take some, mm -hmm. I don't want to say chances, that's the wrong way to describe it, but I want folks to have an opportunity to learn how to, to do this the right way. And so I think just understanding an application that comes back to us might be the best place to start and not limiting it to any um, any certain business yeah. or license type or, but I or do, concept. Yeah, I do agree with the like like transportation plan or people have to be staying overnight or something right. like that. Yeah, and, and right. people are going to have to work with us recognizing that no matter how you feel about this or, or if you've experienced or not experienced problems recognizing these events are going on around the state, you know, a, a false step here could really knock us back mm -hmm. from more widespread consumption, you know. I think yep. so. Yeah, I'm picturing, I may have already mentioned it, but just kind of a two step process here, which would be you have to get licensed through the CCB as a special event operator. Um, and that would just ensure, for our purposes, that you've got the kind of requisite training around serving and serving sizes and uh, highway safety information that you're going to share with your consumers and um, overconsumption, intoxication, etc. Um, and then special event operator licensees would then apply for a local permit, a local um, special event permit tied to the specific event that they're planning. You know, the local law enforcement, local select boards would have the approval process to say, okay, well this meet, you have a highway safety plan, you have a screening plan, you know, a public view screening plan, um, you have kind of your gated ID check, you know, plan um, in order for this specific site, for this specific event. Um, and so, that, you know, the local folks would have the ability to just know what's going on, just like they do for uh, alcohol events.
license. So would then that limit <coughs> these licenses and only areas that have opted in? Well, I would assume that this is a retail license. You know, you are doing retail. So yeah, I think it would. Okay, just asking. Yeah. I think it needs to be, but I wish that wasn't the case. Pardon me, though. Uh, it might encourage some towns that are heavy in events. If it's a popular thing, they might be encouraged to opt in. Brynn, did that give you enough to kind of I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Make a recommendation to the legislature. I think we all kind of agree. Are there any outstanding issues for this that we didn't cover? Nope. Nope. I think that's good. You got more to go through, so. Should we do on site consumption? Yeah, I mean, up to you guys how you want to, if you want to address all of these or just a few. So, again, on site consumption, you know, for all the reasons I think special event permitting is important. Um, I think on-site consumption is equally as important. Obviously, um, as we mentioned, there's no legal place for anyone but homeowners in Vermont to consume. You know, your landlord could restrict it in your lease. Um, if you're kind of in federally uh, subsidized housing, it's illegal. Um, if you're in any place of public accommodation, it's illegal. If you're in, you know, we're essentially saying come to Vermont, purchase our cannabis and don't consume it. <laughs> so uh, I think it's unrealistic to not have on-site consumption. I think New York built it into their law. They haven't done it yet. I think a number of other states have built it into their law. Um, I know that private on-site consumption lounges exist around this country where you kind of pay an admission fee or a membership fee and you can go in and consume. Um, they're unregulated, of course, but um, there's, there, this one, I think, needs a lot more thought only because of the kind of health implications to the employees of these on-site uh, consumptions being exposed to um, smoke continuously as part of your job, uh, particulate matter in the air. Um, there's obviously ways around that, um, but I think this one, I think this one, while I agree philosophically with it, really needs us to demonstrate some modicum of success with special event licensing before we really full-throated say we're ready for on-site consumption lounges. So in New York you can consume wherever a cigarette can be smoked. Right. So that's everywhere. like no. everywhere. And that's not, you, that's not what we have here. <laughs> no. <laughs> so it's very different. Um, but I agree with the kind of demonstrated exp um, experience with um, event licenses and then moving to on-site consumption. I think I'd like to see on-site consumption when we do move it forward be exclusive to um, social equity applicants to start with. Um, but I, I do see a reason to kind of move it down the road a little. Yeah. I, I agree. So do we want to make a recommendation on this? We're not required to by, by statute. However, we could just say that um, we think that this is a good idea for these reasons. Um, we could just leave it there. We think mm -hmm. it's a good idea for these reasons. And if the legislature wants to do it, then we'll figure out how to do it. Yeah. I mean, I think if we're picking priorities, yeah. um, I would put event uh, licenses and um, the other things that we've talked about first, yeah. delivery first, um, and then say, this is great. We don't need to do it now, though. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think there's so many outstanding questions, whether it's in the public or at the legislature, on what this is all going to look like. And if we make these incremental steps to try to, like I keep saying, unlock the fear of, of what this is and what we're about and what this is about, it's only going to help us down the road. But you present anybody too much too fast and you don't know how they're going to react. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and those are the ones that we're required to talk about. Do you want to get through the rest and come back to these other license types? Sure. Is that better? I'd like to talk about cottage licensing at some point. It doesn't we, have to be now. Yeah, I'm just, we can talk about all of them now. I just don't want to um, neglect the things that we have to do. Um, but uh, I'm happy to talk about these now. Should we do start with just, we can start with cottage manufacturing. So I think this is a nice 
low barrier for manufacturing, particularly with edibles, small kitchen. I think it actually pairs nicely with the event license. So if somebody wants to have small treats, edible treats, but they're only gonna make them during wedding season, for example, or for a particular convention or a particular event, I think we could probably follow the rules that we have now for um, like the sort of the non-professional like home kitchen production, which is I think under $10,000 a production before it has to go to a professional kitchen. Um, I think this is a, a good low barrier uh, way to enter the market. So I would like to do this. I'd like to recommend it. So for me, um, when I think about all of our license types, um, I think it's really important just for my sake. Um, and I say for my sake, really, because, you know, to create a license type, one, it has to be feasible. I think it has to be a feasible business. And two, um, we need to know how to regulate it, how much to regulate it, how often to regulate it, how often we want to stop by. And so it needs to have a really clear distinction in my mind. I need to have a really clear distinction in my mind between what um, the very the differences between the various tiers are. Obviously, cultivator, it's easy because it's all based on canopy size. But to me, I'm having a hard time picturing what the difference between this and our tier, whatever the non-combustible, tier two mm -hmm. um, product manufacturing is. Um, I see the, the license cost, $2,500, is potentially being a barrier for someone who wants to do small, small batch production. So right, that's the, that's the proposed Yep, so to be clear, the proposal B, which is what we put forward to the legislature, was $1,500 for the Tier 2 manufacturing. Um, the updated proposal that we're going to look at today um, has been bumped up to $2,500 for that tier. So if we had a cottage tier of manufacturing and it was aligned with the um, small cultivator, it would be a little less expensive in terms of entering the market. Um, and it might be more feasible for someone to do in their home. I think, <clears throat> I think to add on to, to that, because I'm, I'm understanding what, what you're getting at, I think we've heard, or at least I've heard from potential manufacturers that want to do it on a small scale of all of the potential requirements they could seek down the road from fire safety and others. And how do we find ways to ensure that there's clarity for very small batch, you know, producers that are not looking to use the crazy, you know, more expensive, more dangerous methods of extraction um, and, and allow them to kind of do this in a setting that isn't cost prohibitive, not necessarily from the fees we're going to charge, but retrofitting and updating certain spaces that they might have to, you know, do depending on where they're at and who they're working with. I think that's, that's just another, you know, part of the conversation. And from an equity perspective, the cannabis industry is losing women, just like every other industry. I mean, the cannabis industry started off with more CEOs who were women, and over the last two years, that's dropped. So this is potentially something that people can do from home, which is what lots of folks are looking to do now, um, and start their own business. So if this is about the fee, I would suggest we just leave the tier one, tier two, and leave the, the lower fee for tier two and just allow people to scale appropriate to their need uh, within that tiering structure. But do they have to, my recollection of the rules though, is that then they have to have a professional kitchen almost, right? Like that's sort of what we wrote in terms of the sanitary requirements. Whereas Vermont already has, don't we already have cottage rules for certain production? And I think we heard in one of our subcommittees that those cottage rules have been used in other states for cottage licensing for cannabis. So why wouldn't we just apply that in Vermont? I guess I don't know that distinction. I mean, to me, it's just really important to have a distinction, which is the distinction here is uh, you don't have to be held to this standard or that standard. That, that to me is really, you know, when we have a tier, I just want to make sure it's clear what the difference between a tier two and a cottage tier is. So if there is some sort of cottage allowance for kitchen inspections, then I, I would definitely want to consider this, but I just, I don't know that. I just don't know the specifics. So 
I want to say, was it Jacob that talked about that? I can't remember now, but I'd be, I mean, we can talk about it in the next meeting and I can get the information. But I remember that in one of our subcommittee meetings, they talked about the cottage rules that Vermont has for other industries being something that's been applied elsewhere um, for other states and cannabis. If we can just, mm -hmm. if we can come back to this just in a way that really clarifies for me, and, it, and if it is just this kitchen inspection or kitchen standards that people have to, you know, adhere to, because I agree that, you know, for tier two, I would assume that we have, I can't quite remember, but we have some pretty significant health and safety issues because you could essentially be making, you know, thousands of products a day. And if this is, you know, but we already have a home production benchmark in Vermont, which is $10,000. So we could apply that benchmark here. Okay. And it would be, that would, I mean, $10,000 of cannabis product is a very small amount. And would you anticipate us visiting each one of these every year? Probably at licensing mm -hmm. at the start, yes. But I don't know how many there would be. It might be a small, it might be maybe 100, maybe 50. Okay. In the scale of Vermont, that's a lot. In the scale of licensing, it's not huge. Yeah. So the Department of Health calls them home-based food establishments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I think cottage is just a general moniker that's used to, to talk about these, but there are certain exemptions in place that allow you to do this. Yeah. And so, I, I, I kind of agree. I want to see what this is versus how the tier two is going to do, but I like the concept and I, and I think we just I, just, I need to have that clarity in my mind. But I think recognizing that the big, the big burden here might not necessarily be the fee that we propose. It might be everything else they need to do to scale up to the commercial kitchen, regardless if they're tier two or tier one. I think that's kind of my interest in this. Okay. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to just look at the home-based food establishment exemptions, what, mm -hmm. what those provide, and look at what we are requiring of a tier two, and just make sure that there, for me, there's a clear delineation. So when someone asks me, well, what is the cottage license, I, I can really understand um, just what what the difference between a tier two and a cottage would be. Fair enough. Yeah, both generally like home bakery with annual sales under 600, 6,500 bucks, or in a staff food manufacturing establishment with annual sales under 10,000 bucks. I don't know how those translate considering price points are a lot different than what we're doing versus food, but um, it looks like they do it based off of how much you're generating from a dollars and cents perspective. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, limited retail. Uh, store within a store. I wondered actually if this is needed if we have a delivery license. I mean I'm not opposed to it in general um, but if folks are able to have, because I, I think the original goal was that if there's a town that's really too small to stand up it's a, an individual brick and mortar mm -hmm. um, store. Is this um, style of retail needed if delivery is allowed? Not from a consumer perspective, but from a small business perspective, possibly. I mm -hmm. mean, it's one more product, especially one that people are going to travel for. And, you know, go to your local general store uh, when you're visiting and purchase some cannabis, some Vermont brand cannabis. Uh, I could see how, you know, some struggling general stores might really want to have something like this. Yeah, I look at it, I had it through that lens, not necessarily benefiting the consumers, and it's, it's not necessarily our job to come and save the struggling general stores <laughs> in Vermont that are, that are closing and that have closed, but I think we could, you know, lend a hand to that cause and that effort and, and help give them an opportunity to, you know, add something new to what they're already doing. My one question is some of these general stores also sell liquor. So can we sell liquor and cannabis in the same building? I don't have the answer to that question. I don't know if any of us do. Could we legally do that? Um, other than that, I, I support the, the concept. 
Would we require all the same um, security requirements for the sort of um, co-located retail as we do for an independent retailer? Um, <clears throat> well, what we did with the co-located, do we do co-located retail? No, that's what this no. was originally called. Oh, you, okay. Yeah, sorry. The only thing you can't locate is limited co located is to retail establishments. I mean, it really, to me, depends on how much product these places are moving. You know, how much, like how much are they going to have on site? I mean, I think, you know, we, what we say here is that there would be limited uh, amounts of cannabis. Uh, so this wouldn't be kind of a full-on retail. I mean, you know, I see this as kind of the two different models, and either one or both could exist, which is kind of you have a section off the corner of your store um, where you have kind of an age check and maybe even a separate register and you go purchase in that corner of the store. Um, or it's kind of more like cigarettes where they're behind the counter and you can ask for them. There's no signage, there's no display, there's nothing that would indicate, you know, maybe there's a little pot leaf somewhere or something. But, you know, you could ask for it and they could pull it out from behind the counter, the, the, the store owner, and sell it to you at the traditional point of sale. Yeah, and I mean, this, this, this license type does present a lot more questions for us to answer than I think other license types do. I think if we were to do it in the spirit of the limited, what's it called even? I can't remember. Retail. Limited retail, like this one might be where we look at it. I know in our other license types we've talked about, we're not in a position to limit certain license types um, to a specific number, you know, or whatever, but this could, like, what if a gas station applies for this license type? What if a grocery store applies for this license type? So we might need to be more selective on how many of these licenses we award and what the actual optics of certain stores that may apply for these look like, just because, you know, the more we put this into the hands of a store that has kids under the age of 21 involved, the more you know, likelihood there could be potential you know, law enforcement or legal problems, you know, think, down the road. Yeah, I think it's that that I'm, I'm thinking about in terms of security. Like, what is what youth prevention tactics will be in place if it's in their local general store versus in a separate store? Uh, I'm, in, I'm, I'm for proposing that we think it's a good idea in the spirit of how Vermont likes to, people here like to purchase products and mm -hmm. figuring out a path forward to making it viable but I think it'll it'll end up being something that we need to be very prescriptive over and not you know having a different philosophy for this license type than every other license type that I think we're gonna you know be reviewing applications for yeah it's a tough one um, certainly I would say no visible products no visible signage no visible advertising um, and then as far as security, you know, it could be commiserate with what we do for general retail stores. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Like for liquor, there's a separate, there's an entrance within the store, right? So the liquor stores that are in general stores now have a separate entrance within the store that can be locked separately. You can't really see in, all, well, some places you can see in better than others, but it's definitely like a separate space. Yeah. I've seen it, I've seen the one in the Maple Fields in Berlin. It's just right out there in the open. Oh. Yeah. Well, and I've seen it both ways. Yeah. Though. The yeah. Hannaford's yeah. has Hannaford's the right. separate entrance right. and so does Mazza's, right? It has yeah, a separate right. entrance. Yeah, I've seen it both ways. Yeah. I have not seen the other. With beer and wine I have, but not with actual. Uh, no, the Maple Fields in Berlin, you can yeah. go buy liquor oh. right next to the the candy. I learned something new today. The idea. But then that gets back to my question, and I don't know if we know it right now. Can we sell this in the same establishment that you can sell liquor and tobacco yeah. and everything else? Uh, that might move out the cool idea, or make general stores choose which they would rather, right. you know, sell. I don't know. Maybe we're not ready to. To move this one forward right now considering everything I, I don't know but I like the concept yeah. if we can figure out the nuts and bolts I think that's 
I mean, it's a good way for like an incubator program to begin, right? But I think we have a lot of security and prevention questions to answer. Why don't we go through our security regs before next Monday uh, when we meet at 11 o'clock on Monday and um, try and think through some of this. And we'll hear from our advisory committee in the meantime as well. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get public comment on it too. Yeah, and see if there's things that we would feel comfortable eliminating that we have in place for a brick and mortar retail um, or expanding upon for this. Yeah. Um, and we can see if we can come to some sort of consensus. We don't have to figure out the whole thing, but just think about really what's the difference between this and a brick and mortar and um, you know a standalone and what it wh how we would want it to look. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like we're all wanting to explore it further. Yeah. Okay. Um, entry level or reduced rate retail, uh, sometimes referred to as farm gate, sometimes referred to as direct consumer sales. So, you know, it's, what's always hung me up, and I think I know how other people would react. <laughs> is that there's really no prohibition on direct consumer sales. There's no prohibition on a cultivator also having a retail license. Um, I think that, the, the, of course, the issue there is, well, you've got all these regulations for retail licenses that it makes it not viable for me as a small cultivator to um, you know, comply with those regulations. But the way that I see it is the reason why we have so much regulation around retail is because of the federal status of cannabis and because of the FinCEN and Bank Secrecy Act. You know, we really have to know what's being sold. We have to know that people aren't, um, you know, diverting product, diverting cash, etc. cetera. Um, and we have, you know, some responsibility that we've taken on by giving someone a license to make sure that they're complying with these federal kind of guidance documents. And so we don't, as a state, have to deal with the Department of Justice or the DEA or whatever else coming in. So um, this, I really do, I mean, I think we can all picture a Vermont market where direct consumer is allowed. I mean, we see it at our general stores with liquor. We see it, you know, at Hill Farmstead, at The Alchemist, at every farm stand. We see um, just kind of direct consumer sales. Um, but to me, this direct consumer this year in this kind of initial outlay of licenses, to me, is kind of a chicken and egg problem because once we give someone the ability to retail, um, we need to go on site and make sure that they're in compliance with everything that um, would ensure that we're in line with kind of FinCEN and BSA guidance. And, you know, I just don't think that we have the compliance and enforcement staff or any staff to really do that. Initially, yeah, you know, I tend to agree, and I know there's a lot of very passionate folks out there that want to see this as part of our program, and I think it does have a place in our program. I'm having trouble seeing it as part of our program as of January 4th, 2022, and this year of us trying to launch. I know that you know, I've heard this would help bring more folks from the illicit world into what we're trying to do. Um, I kind of look at it in a different way, uh, especially if, if small cultivators or cultivators are going to be selling this directly from their farm, I want to make sure that they can sell, excuse me, that they can grow and cultivate this product in a regulated market before we allow them to do that, plus comply with, you know, what, what you referred to um, through a retail lens. I think, again, um, being able to demonstrate a successful market on phase one will help us get to where some folks want us to go next year or late next year or down the road at some point. I agree. I mean, I think that you can add on a retail license. There's nothing that prohibits folks from having a cooperative model selling to a retail. I think there's lots of opportunities to sell that are relatively low barrier that 
Yeah, and the other, you know, the, there's licenses that have been awarded in, in Canada to sell directly from your farm, but those are little brick and mortar stores on your farm that folks are selling from. Yeah. This doesn't exist anywhere else. It doesn't mean it can't exist here first, but I think, you know, given everything, we're not ready right now to move this license type forward. Yeah. It doesn't prevent somebody from trying to build a brick and mortar store on their, you know, farm yeah. and selling it through that. Yeah. So on this one, I think we will get there. I just don't think that we're ready to do that with this initial outlay of licenses. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, that that's an end goal because, you know, this is one that can really um, cannibalize a traditional retail operation. I, and so anyone who's thinking about a retail should know that the board, I think, just said on the record that we want to move towards a direct consumer sales once we have our feet under us once we have kind of our, we know what our resources are and how we can really enforce this. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard from retailers that don't have a problem with direct to consumer sales, but they want it to be to play by the same rules as right. those that are selling it from the farm. And I think everything we just said says, okay, if you want to sell from your farm, you need to do what is required of a retail license holder. Right. I just, I, I think this is an add on that we could, I, I, I hope to see in the coming years, if not next year, but I think we need to get, you know, to a successful launch of the program first before we before we do that. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we've been through all of these. Yep. All right. Ready to move on from license types to the second recommendation that you're required to make is about whether um, there should be a minimum about amount of CBD in cannabis products to aid in the prevention of cannabis-induced psychosis that occurs in some users. Um, I just wanted to refresh your recollection about the um, recommendations you made in the November 1st report to the legislature uh, about um, THC potency, public health issues. Um, so the solid concentrates issue, we recommended um, that cannabis licensees be allowed to produce extractions with 60% uh, or greater um, THC for purposes of incorporating those into other cannabis products. Um, also made the recommendation that, um, that the legislature should remove from the prohibited products list solid concentrates with um, THC concentration of 60% or above for people who are over 25, 25 or older. And also um, the recommendation that uh, the board have jurisdiction over the manufacture and sale of products containing um, any of the deltas that have, um, that have certain effects. So um, also, in, in context of this recommendation, the exploratory subcommittee um, at its December meeting spoke about um, this recommendation and reviewed uh, the Massachusetts review of the existing scientific literature and, and data coming out of Massachusetts and their conclusion that there really was not sufficient evidence to recommend um, a concentration of CBD be included. Um, and the subcommittee also concluded that there was insufficient evidence to impose that legal minimum CBD amount. So, for your discussion. So I, I really don't know where to begin with this. I mean, I, I, I have heard the science um, that having a certain amount of CBD is a benefit to people, as, uh, but where, how much, and why we would require it, to me is just way out of our depth and way out of our really regulatory mandate. So, and if Massachusetts did an extensive review of the existing scientific literature and said, we don't know whether this is a good thing or not, I mean, why would we do anything on this? I think it's not only out of our depth, I think it seems to be out of everybody's depth. Yeah. <laughs> at, the, at, the, at this point in time. So yes. I don't think that makes sense for us to make a recommendation and get ahead of, right. you know, science that is evolving. It's, mm -hmm. it's evolving because of the federal status and, you know, it, science data is interesting because depending on who's funding certain data streams or whatever the case may be, you know, you can arrive at a, at a destination that you might have pre-selected inherently. So um, until there's 
you know, more unbiased data, I think it makes sense for us to just not recommend anything. I, I'm fine with not recommending it. I don't think we need to, but I also don't, I want to make sure it's not prohibited. Right. I don't think it's prohibited or if it is, I mean, certainly not in flour. We're talking about uh, mm -hmm. manufactured products. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's prohibited. If there's there's um there's some provisions that indicate that they can't be in, sold in the same part of the store, but okay. um, we're dealing with that elsewhere. Yep. Okay, so we can move on from this one. So finally, um, there's a requirement that we issue a recommendation regarding the display and sale of cannabis-related paraphernalia that's sold by um, non-cannabis establishment licensees. Okay. So, can I just clarify, so that's sold by non-cannabis establishment licensees. So, does that mean if it's sold by a cannabis establishment licensee that it's regulated it by us, not right. by tobacco, or would it, I need help. Yep. So, <laughs> I think, I mean, the direct, often the direct words of the legislature do need a little clarification. <laughs> um, so there, there is a requirement in statute now that if you want to sell tobacco um, paraphernalia, uh, that you have to have a license from DLL. And I believe that's a second class license. So um, presumably people who are cannabis establishments, people who seek a license from us and receive one, who would want to sell cannabis related paraphernalia, if that could also be interpreted to be tobacco related paraphernalia, they would need to also have a license from DLL. There's no legal distinction between cannabis-related paraphernalia and tobacco-related paraphernalia? So, not that I know of, no. Could we make one, do you think, by regulation? As in, if you are a cannabis retail licensee, the pipes and bongs that you sell in your store are cannabis-related paraphernalia, they're not tobacco I'd have to look at the definition of tobacco related paraphernalia in okay. Title VII. Um, I don't have it in front of me. Yes. Yeah, I think that's interesting, but I think re requiring, you know, the way this reads to me is that you can only sell these, you know, paraphernalia on pipes, bongs, whatever else you want to at, at a dispensary, and, and I think that's just not necessary. I mean, there's adult stores, there's gas stations, there's everything else that sells, you know, these products. and. If their intent was to ask us, can these only be sold at that retail locations that are also selling cannabis? Am I am I getting that wrong? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. I think that's the question. I think yep. if it's sold outside of a cannabis retail establishment, then I don't think we want to be responsible. For I don't want to be responsible <laughs> for that. Trust me, but I want to make sure that those folks, that, oh, those those vendors, <laughs> or people operating those establishments, don't right. get unintentionally, you know, you know swept up in something that we're a decision that we're trying to make because people have certain shops that they like to shop at for certain products as it relates to apparatuses and i don't want to force them to go to a certain place to buy the apparatus recognizing that it's already regulated as a class two license yeah. from the ll so what kind of recommendation do we want to make on this? I think what we, what we would say potentially is something along the lines of we don't know what cannabis related paraphernalia means. Um, and so whatever the current um, current status of cannabis related paraphernalia is, we want to leave it alone. I'm interested in your, your trying to thread the needle because what I don't want necessarily um, is for DLL if we're not going to work with DLL to help on our enforcement to have a backdoor into getting into a cannabis retail establishment if that retail establishment does decide to sell paraphernalia. So we need to understand where there, make sure there is no overlapping jurisdiction so we don't get subverted. Um, I'm not saying that there's anything nefarious that DLL would necessarily do, but I think that that's a something that I was thinking of when I. I saw this. We also don't know the limitations on getting that class two license. So can you have a criminal background and get a class two license? Yeah. 
would you be limited in being able to sell, like if you were a retailer, right, we've specifically opened the door for folks with criminal backgrounds. Would they be then limited in what they can sell if you're not allowed to sell those things under the class two license? So it seems like we would want to be able to regulate it if it's in a cannabis establishment, but otherwise not. Yeah. If that if we can. is a possibility. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, no one is forcing a cannabis licensee to sell cannabis related paraphernalia. So in some ways they're opening that door themselves if they want. And then DLL, you know, has authority. You know, they're opening the door to that authority. Um, that's yeah. that regulation. It seems unrealistic though. Like, so you're gonna, you, we would expect a retailer to sell flour, but not a pipe? You know, it's their choice. I mean, if there's, you know, essentially, Unless we change, unless we have a definition of cannabis-related paraphernalia that's different than tech, tobacco-related paraphernalia. Um, no, there, yeah, there is not one right now. The tobacco-related paraphernalia is pretty. It's a, it's a pretty broad definition. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. That does include rolling papers, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it includes bongs. It includes most things that I think you would think of as potentially falling yes. under cannabis-related paraphernalia. Because at the time, that was the only way you could sell those things, right? right. You couldn't sell them if they were cannabis-related. Right. My only concern is making sure that whether it's gas stations or adult stores or whoever else is selling or glass shops that have that specific purpose don't get swept up unintentionally of us yeah. trying to take jurisdiction by then not being able to do it unless they have a retail license from us, which would moot out a lot of those products from being sold elsewhere. So we could either, we could go one of two ways on this. I think one would be just saying, let the status quo survive, you know, untouched, don't recommend any changes, just let all pipes, bongs, paraphernalia be regulated as tobacco paraphernalia the way that it is currently. Or we could say we believe that can like we should have a definition for cannabis related paraphernalia that's exclusive to, that, for paraphernalia that's exclusively sold by a cannabis retail licensee and there's no tobacco on premises, there's nothing tobacco related, it's all tied to you know the cannabis retail. And then we have jurisdiction over that paraphernalia. Right. I think if we can do that I'll I like that. Can we do it? Like, I don't know. It might be easier to just go. Hesitantly, I say that's my preference, but I might be. I might. <laughs> you know, I think it's really just a recommendation. Yes. Yeah. David will tell us if we can do it or not. Not right now. Um, okay. Yeah, because it's your broadcasting. <laughs> right. Oh. Sorry about that. Sorry. Well, now everybody. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, status quo. We'll see what happens. So we'll, perfect um, cue, though. <laughs> we will review. Um, we will review this again on Thursday and again on Monday. Okay. So okay. We, can, we can discuss more. So I'm going to move on. Um, another thing that the legislature required us to um, do is to work with some various state agencies um, to develop outreach, training, and employment programs that are focused on providing economic opportunities to people who historically have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition, which we are doing. Um, but the board has talked about how this may be kind of an in or an opportunity for um, for the board to make some legislative recommendations um, that may encourage the legislature to enact some policies that could serve to mitigate um, some of the economic harms that have been caused by cannabis prohibition. So um, some ideas that the board has discussed are here in the bulleted points. Um, at recommending that the legislature allocate a percentage of the cannabis excise tax um, to the business development fund that they've created on an annual basis, um, create a cannabis community reinvestment fund um, similar to what other states have done, for example, New York, that um, would be set up to provide resources to specifically to communities that have um, experienced that disproportionate impact. Um, and then recommend that a percentage of the excise tax be devoted to that fund on an annual basis. So, for, for your discussion. 
So, um, I, uh, I always have a little bit of a tough time when it comes to us making recommendations about how the tax revenue is spent. Um, that's clearly outside of our authority, and it's clearly not contemplated as something that um, we should be deciding. Um, but that being said, the Cannabis Business Development Fund is woefully underfunded, um, and it is not going to have any sort of, you know, massive impact um, to helping social equity applicants. Um, get off the ground in the, in the absence of banking and traditional access to capital. So, um, there, you know, what we did obviously is we said as a condition of licensure, our higher tiers cultivators can contribute to that fund, contribute a portion of their profits um, as a way to kind of have some sustained revenue source going into it. Um, but I do think that given the cornerstone of this legislation being social equity and trying to mitigate the harms of prohibition, that making this recommendation would not be outside of the bounds of what we should be doing. I agree. I agree. This is central to the mission that the legislature gave us. Right. Okay. So I would say yes to all three of those bullet points in some form or another. To me, it seems like the most immediate need is the Cannabis Business Development Fund right. um, and putting a significant percentage in there. Um, I really like um, the idea of the Cannabis Community Reinvestment Fund, but I also know that there's other money coming into the state of Vermont through ARPA funds and other funds now that I mean, maybe those funds can support some of those efforts, but there's other, there's other money available for the types of programs that that might um, benefit and then yes it should there should be some sort of annual funding I don't think that we can just say cannabis community reinvestment fund and not have a more detailed plan for what that looks like and how that money is allocated mm -hmm. um, I know that H414 does have a plan um, the plan I think is a little unwieldy you know I know that we as a board tried to define disproportionately impacted communities um, and economic opportunity zones, and I found both of those processes to be incredibly over-inclusive and at the same time not targeted enough to, to actually reach people that needed it. So, and we left a lot of people out as well that are, that have been harmed by prohibition by trying to just kind of find zip codes or policing districts or whatever else to kind of figure out what an impacted community is. So we have to we, we would have to find some way to say I, if we just tell the legislature cannabis can reinvestment funds, they'll spend the next year, the next session, mm -hmm. trying to define what that means, what that means, and who gets to allocate the money and how much. And you know, I think if we're going to make that recommendation, we have to be a little bit more prescriptive to the legislature about what it means, what it is, and what it looks like. Um, and that's a whole different conversation. I mean. I, that's my own feeling on that. So I think I agree. I think if you, I, I think I agree. It would take the legislature some time to sort of develop what that meant and to define it. Yeah. I think we could provide them with some details. Um, you know, we could say it could go to mental health. You know, we know that in terms of disproportionate impact, we know that you know, people of color don't receive the same level of mental health. They haven't received the same level of, of health care in general. So we could be specific about how it was used um, and where it went. You know, maybe it went towards programs like where um, social services is supporting police departments and answering calls so that they're providing social services instead of police services. Yeah. I. I think it makes sense, and honestly, every modern, more recent, I should say, uh, legal state has included something along mm -hmm. these lines. So it's a little bit of an oversight that it's not in, you know, S25 or Act 62, Act 164. Um, and I think that this conversation will come up. I'm happy to support it. 
I, I just, uh, you know, I mean, we can just support it and just see what happens. I certainly support the concept. Yeah. Do you think that we need to prioritize which of these things is most important so that the legislature puts their efforts in the right place? You know, I, I don't need to, I don't mean to prognosticate about the legislature's intent or what they're going to be able to do. I do think that the Cannabis Business Development Fund is essential to a socially equitable um, and effective market. Um, and so we can very easily say this fund is insufficient to actually do what it's intended to do. Um, and then we could say, and by the way, um, if you really want to correct the harms of prohibition, the war on drugs, that you need to reinvest in the communities that have been harmed um, with, the, with, the, with the excise tax and just not get more specific about what that mm -hmm. looks like. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think yeah. I think we need, you know, both of these funds, recognizing that the community reinvestment fund, we're gonna have to help do some legwork to make sure that it's and and some of the legwork has already been done by advocates that have, you know tried to to do this already. Um, so I don't want to take credit for that, but. And I think it's fair to prioritize. Every leader is busy, right? The legislature is incredibly busy. So they're going to want to hear from us what is the most important, what is necessary to make this work. And I think it's fair to say that that is the Cannabis Business Development Fund, but that the repair is needed through the uh, reinvestment fund. And I do think the Business Development Fund is extremely necessary. I mean, I know you mentioned DARPA funding. I, I wonder how federal funds can be used in this industry in general. I didn't mean it for the business fund. I meant for like the community reinvestment, okay. meaning that okay. if there are like community projects that, that, that ARPA funding that. can go, there's, okay. yeah, there's yeah, lots yeah. of okay. other funding that's coming into the right. state. It's unusual right now. No, I, I get that. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> Anything more on, on these? Okay. Would we want to talk about a specific percentage that we would suggest, or would we want to just put that in the hands of the legislature to allocate a certain percentage? I mean, I don't think either, I don't want to pull a number out of a hat right now because that's not well informed, but would that be something that we need to? The Social Equity Subcommittee said, I think, five to ten percent for okay. the business development fund I think we should do higher okay. I think we got recommendations for 20 percent for that okay sure 20 percent right. I don't think uh, yeah they're gonna I mean, do what they're gonna do that's absolutely yeah. right but at least they have a starting point I, I just needed a starting point before yeah. we you know, I'm glad that that. Yes. Thanks for the reminder that that was discussed. Okay. I'm going to move on. So the next part um, of the discussion today is going to be about this revised fee structure proposal. Um, so at our meeting in November with Ways and Means, um, when we presented the October 15th report and the associated fee structure recommendations, um, you'll remember that the committee did express um, some concern that some of the fees may have been too low um, and asked that we return with a new proposal. Um, so what I've put together here is proposal C and it increases the price per square foot um, in a way that keeps those lower tier cultivators um, relatively the same as proposal B, which was our original recommendation. Um, and then it increases the price per square foot for the middle and the higher tiers um, and gradually becoming more expensive as the tiers get higher. Um, and just a note that the license fees here for the upper tiers for indoor cultivation are um, higher overall as compared to other states. Um, and I've included the slide that we submitted with the October 15th report that does a comparison to those other states. Um, so here are, here's proposal C, and um, you can see it in comparison to the other two proposals that were submitted um, on October 15th. So you can see the first two outdoor tiers, one and two, are the same. 
um, as what we proposed uh, proposal B, and then the and then the price per square foot goes up a little bit as you get higher higher, and the mixed tier just goes up fifty dollars. So I'd like to just talk briefly on the so we're totally looking at outdoor and um, you know we've received a number of public comments about the inequity between uh, indoor and outdoor output, um, particularly in Vermont, um, based on our climate. And um, it does seem, I know we have or equivalent plant count written there. Um, and I just want to expand upon that a little bit. Um, I know that the thousand square foot was given to us um, by the legislature as the definition of small cultivator. Um, I do think that the legislature did not want to um, prioritize indoor cultivation, um, you know, implicitly. Uh, by They didn't make a distinction between indoor versus outdoor. So um, I think this could be an opportunity for us, you know, I, I see it written there, the equivalent plant count, but to actually propose an equivalent plant count to the legislature for outdoor that would yield a similar amount um, as a thousand foot indoor cultivation. Would we do that just for the thousand square feet or would we have equivalent plant counts for other tiers? Um, see, the thing is, you know, I think we almost want to do it for all of them except, uh, you know, I, I know why we chose the 37.5 and, and I don't want there to be concurrent too much concurrent jurisdiction with other agencies that really slows down mm -hmm. um, our licensing process. Um, and, you know, the... Well, in tier, is it tier five and six that we're not going to open right away, or just tier six? Which, or that was indoor? That was indoor. Okay. Um, but maybe we have equivalent plant counts for the kind of tier one through four. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so the way that I, I mean, if we want to present that to the legislature and ask them for approval, I'd be fine with it. But in trying to figure out this plant count methodology, I really thought that our our best effort, or our easiest glide path to doing this without, I'm not going to say without legislative oversight, but at least without legislative trying to make us present another option as they already have, which is frustrating, I think, in and of itself. Is 904A, small cultivators, we have the ability to do a little bit more for the smaller tiers. Um, so I was thinking in reviewing this concept, making it just for the smaller tiers and attaching a plan count to that because we could probably do it through rulemaking without as much legislative oversight. So which, is that just tier one? Tier one is, is we have to tie it to the definition of small cultivator. From th that's my my scheme. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> if we want to talk about doing it for other tiers, I'm happy to, to do that. But I think I think through rulemaking we could we could do it. We have enough power in Act 164 to make special accommodations for small cultivators, and there is no as you said, differentiation between indoor and outdoor at the small cultivator and the small cultivator definition. And that's why tying the indoor plant count, average plant count, recognizing different methodologies of growing indoors to an outdoor plant count that would be equivalent to that indoor thousand square foot. Does that, so in terms of plant count, would that, does that help with the flowering versus total canopy concern that's been raised to us? I think that it does. I think, um, I'm sure there's folks out there who would rather just have it be flowering canopy versus yeah. total canopy, and I certainly understand that. I think f from the point of regulating, plant count will be easier than asking inspectors to go out there with a, a tape measure or yeah. something along those lines to kind of see what's actually going on. Um, but, but I think, again, my view, and I could be corrected, happy to always be corrected, is that attaching the plan count to just tier one or just to small cultivators gives us the authority to do it without having to go ask for a legislative change like the definition of plant canopy or 
you know, are we pushing the bounds too much of legislative intent by attaching a plan count to higher tiers? I'm not against doing that. I'm just, I yeah. thought this would be, that just the tier one would be most within our, strictly our jurisdiction to do. So you did a lot of work with the folks at A&R on this. If, if for some reason outdoor cultivation was deemed to be an agricultural activity and an agricultural product, would Act 250 apply for the larger tiers? Or, you know, <laughs> I think it still would because I think if certain things did happen at the legislature, I think that, that that fix only attaches itself to small cultivators, not all outdoor cultivators. Okay. That's what was introduced. Yeah. Is that is that under an acre though, or is there an acreage attached to that? And now we're going to get into Act 250. Okay. We don't have to do that. Either. So, so there's 10-acre towns and there's one-acre towns, and there's a reason Vermont Supreme Court opinion that says... That's okay. <laughs> I can Google uh, it later. That's okay. I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head. Um, there's a reason Supreme Court opinion that says, you know, improvement in a one-acre town over an acre falls within Act 250 jurisdiction. But if it's under an acre, it's not under Act 250 jurisdiction, and that's why I asked to pull the tier six square footage from 40,000 down to under an acre. I remember. You know, recognizing that that's not an acre, but the other activities that you might do in the process of creating your yep. your cultivation area might expand beyond an acre. So, yeah, I remember um, so I kept we kept everything under an acre to help people in one acre towns. There's still an, an outsized question on impacts in, in 10 acre towns. I think I explained yeah, that correctly. Yeah, that was you had the characters. Yeah, correct, correct. But, <laughs> but, the, but a bill that was introduced today to make out, out, outdoor small cultivators an agricultural product does not apply to anybody that would not be considered a small cultivator. Okay. I, I mean, I definitely agree with the small, having a, a, a plant count for the small cultivators. I, I guess I could go either way with the other ones. I mean, I think it's probably helpful for the cultivators. Yeah, so the cultivators that I talk to, um, the reason why they really prefer the plant count as opposed to a square footage is because there are ways to really enrich the soil by having kind of lanes in between your mm -hmm. cannabis plot, plots that can um, you know, deal with mites that can um, you know, mitigate soil erosion, et cetera. And, so they don't want to be jammed into a thousand square feet because half of that they would prefer to have um, kind of lanes in between their cannabis plants. So I just don't know. So they're the ones that I have talked to said, you know, a thousand square feet indoors should probably be roughly, and there's kind of a scientific basis for this, or at least kind of a um, mathematical basis, uh, 125 plants outdoors. Um, so when you start to apply that ratio to some of the higher like the 10,000, the 5,000, you're gonna quickly get into Act 250 territory. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do kind of agree with Kyle that maybe we start with the tier one outdoor, maybe tier two if we can find a way to finagle it, um, and then possibly tier three and then and then stop there. Okay. Yeah, I, and I wouldn't be opposed to that. Yeah. I think it'll take some Oh, I don't know if it will, what it will necessarily take, but I think it's more strictly in our jurisdiction to start with tier one, and we might need some help across the street for the higher tiers. As we get further away from the store power of 904A for small cultivators and making accommodations, I wonder, will that stand up to the regulatory process? Yeah. That's my only concern. I, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to attach plant counts to everything if we could. Yeah. All right. Um, well, we can kind of finalize our thinking on this before Monday, yeah. next Monday. So moving on to the indoor um, fees. So again, starting um, the first two tiers are the same as Proposal B and Proposal C, and then they get progressively a little bit higher from where we landed in Proposal B. And again, Tier 6 indoor is the one that is not 
um, immediately going to be opened. Okay. Um, retail. So uh, retail storefront returns to proposal A, um, 10,000. And then the seeds and clones goes up uh, to 2,500 from 1,000. Uh, manufacturing fees returns to proposal A for tier one, and then uh, again goes up to 2,500 for um, tier two. And then based on your discussion this morning, sounds like we're gonna return to the manufacturer cottage tier conversation. Do you have a basic sense of where it should fall price-wise, cost-wise on the fees? Uh, I think it should align with the small cultivator fee. 750? Yeah. Okay, and then this is just the comparison chart. This comes from the October 15th report to comparison with comparable jurisdictions. Um, and again, you know, our consultant has indicated to us that um, the fact that our fees are higher um, than, than they are in comparable jurisdictions may indicate that they're too high to generate much entrepreneurial interest, which could um, leave us in a position where there's not enough regulated product on the market to meet the demand. So I need to say that because they have said that to us on multiple occasions. Um, so you can see 750 to 34,000 is the new range under proposal C, and that is generally a bit higher than what exists in Massachusetts and Maine and Alaska. Mm. Quite a bit higher for indoor. Um, Do you anticipate including this slide specifically in our January 15th report? So no, not in the January 15th report, but this would be relevant for the conversation in Ways and Means okay. um, as they consider this proposal C. And yes, mm -hmm. I was going to include it in that presentation for them. Okay. Still support proposal B. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'm looking for the board's uh, authorization to present proposal C as an alternative um, since they did ask us for, for one. So we are increasing the fees, um, which generates more uh, income, I guess, for the board, but we're also decreasing the entrepreneurial demand, which diminishes our income potential. So um, does this mean that we're going to be asking for roughly the same amount of the excise taxes to support our operations? Yes. And so really the only benefit uh, to going with Proposal C is that um, or the only the only thing that really changes is that we might not have enough cannabis to supply the market. Uh, that's certainly <laughs> one. That's certainly one outcome. Yes, yeah. it doesn't paint a very pretty picture. Yeah. <laughs> well, they asked for a new proposal. Uh -huh. um, I mean, a different proposal. I shouldn't say a new proposal because I don't want to prejudge that they've already dismissed proposal A and proposal B. But. It, it may be helpful for the legislature to see, like, here is proposal C, but it does not, we really end up in a different yeah. place. And that, you know, I am appreciative that, we, that still a pre, we still are team proposal B. I am appreciative <laughs> that it, uh, it keeps fees low yeah. for smaller cultivators, indoor and outdoor. I think the retail license, even if it's consistent with states like Massachusetts, that would be unfortunate. But, yeah, I mean, what are we going to do? They want another option? Give them one. But as I, I hope, I'm sure you'll tell them this, Bren. <laughs> Consider the, uh, the potential outcomes for going with Proposal C. Yep. All right. Do we need to vote on it today, or can we do it as a package on Monday? Um, I think that I don't think you need to vote on it, um, but I do think it would be helpful to just because you're going into ways and means on Thursday. Yeah, have your authorization. There is one more slide um, that has the. Oh, I thought there was one more. Maybe there's not. There it is. Um, of the other piece, I just wanted to go through that quickly before you have your mm -hmm. final conversation. Um, the. 
see a significant difference here for the integrated licensees. Wholesalers return to proposal A. Testing lab stays the same. So does employee registration. Um, local processing fee has been bumped up to $500 from $100. Um, and then the product registration. This is a new fee proposal that was not included in the October 15th report. And um, our November 1st report did introduce the idea that the board could create a product registration process um, as a part of its review to ensure that the Delta products were, um, that were hitting the market were safe. Um, so we're proposing here a $50 per product fee um, that would support both random testing of the products and also the board's review of each product to ensure that it's appropriate for adult use and the label isn't misleading. So. I'm nervous about the product per product. I mean, I think um, it might hinder the market a little bit in terms of creativity and the products that people might develop and their genetics. Like it just, I'm a little nervous about that. I think it's important um, because, not because of the amount, but because it helps you know, helps us make, ensure that all the products that hit the shelves, we know what they are, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that, so it, in, in some ways the fee could be lower um, because it's really the process that we care about. Um, you know, it's just ensuring that that process has been done for every product. Um, I think we would need, obviously right here, we need, it just says per product. We don't know exactly what that means. Right. You know, yeah. you know, we would have to further define that and we can define it in such a way that doesn't really hinder the kind of genetics. It's really about, is this a Delta 8 isolate? Is it a Delta 10 or 11 isolate? Um, uh, what do we know about Delta 8? And at the time we're reviewing it, and is, you know, I think you're right that if it's any variation in the kind of cannabinoid profile requires a new product, registration fee that could be problematic, could hinder innovation. But um, I, I do think that uh, we need we need something. And we could say not to exceed $50, or $50 max per yeah. product. Yeah, and, and the lingo use comes from, I'm sure it's used in many places, but I know in talking with folks at the Agency of Agriculture, they can, they can help support a lot of programs through product registration from a feed and seed perspective, from a pesticide perspective, so on and so forth. So in the ag department or agency, um, do you know who generally who pays this fee? Is it the, the retailer of the product or is it the manufacturer of the product? I think I know, but I don't want to okay. <laughs> get it wrong. I guess it could be either. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, you could have a fewer product manufacturer, you could pay the fee and say, listen, I paid for the fee, it's... I want to say it's the retailer. It's legitimate. How can you generate too much revenue from this fee to pay for pro a state program, you know? If it's a manufacturer making a product, that's one for every retailer that is selling the product versus that retailer who wants to... I don't know. Now I'm talking... I'm <laughs> talking without much... Yeah. I don't. I don't know the specifics of how these registration fees work. Yeah. I think we need to. Or we can leave it, of course. But that I think we have a lot of conversation to have about what what is the product. So if right. somebody's making chocolate chip cookies and then they make snickerdoodles, is that another fifty dollars? You know, I think we need to be very clear about what that is. You don't have any cookies. I don't have any cookies. No? Sorry. All right. <laughs> I'm hungry now. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> all right, well, maybe just, um, Brynn, you could just put that this is a maximum fee for yeah, product, yeah. and that product will be defined by rule or something, or just if asked. But. Would we also apply um, the reduced fee schedule that we have for social equity applicants to this for the product registration? We recommend, you know, we recommended yeah. sort of a a scaling up of the fees mm -hmm. over time. Would we apply that to this as well? I mean, it's, again, to me, it's really the uh, 
the process. You know, this is a way for us to ensure that every product on the shelf, you know, is tested and has some, you know, we know that has known health effects. So to me, the fee isn't quite as important. So mm -hmm. I don't mind scaling it, reducing it, waiving it for social equity applicants, um, as long as they go through the process. Mm -hmm. So that I, in the pesticide context, I, need, I don't have the feed and seed. I know that the feed and seed program at DMC Agriculture is completely funded through product registration, but for pesticides, the manufacturer pays a fee, and then if you want to deal with those pesticides, you also have to pay a fee. Okay. But I mean, it's like, Does it's it not an individual fee, it's like you pay 50 bucks to be a, a, a pesticide retailer, class B dealer. Okay. Uh, but the manufacturer has to individually pay for products that are looked at, made sure they're safely tested in the state per product. Okay. Not to confuse everybody even more, but. <laughs> well, in some ways we have that same structure here because you're paying to be a retail licensee. And now, you're, now the product manufacturer is gonna pay per product, so I think it's yeah. similar. All right, yeah, I think we can give you um, approval of proposal C. Unless I hear an injection. Nope. Nope. Thanks, guys. I um, love this. Thank you. Um, so, uh, why don't we move to public comment? Almost right on time. Um, and we will, um, if you've joined by the link, please raise your virtual hands. Um, we'll try to call you. Nellie, maybe you can help us call people in the order that they've raised their hands. Yep, I can do that. Uh, we've got Amelia first. Hi, guys. Um, so I had a couple thoughts, and I'll try to keep it quick. The first is if you're going to implement an age minimum on concentrates over 60%, then you also need to carve out a medical patient acceptance watch. Um, somebody with a medical card who is under the age of 25 should still be able to access those concentrates, um, given that they're already able to access them within the integrated dispensaries. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking was just in hearing the talk about safe consumption sites, um, it's a little concerning that in 2022 we're still hearing rhetoric about like contact ties and what's safe for the people around you when you're smoking. If you are in a well-ventilated area or you are outside, contact highs do not happen. Um, and there was recently a study done uh, that I will gladly send you guys uh, by the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, that also shows the effect of secondhand cannabis smoke on things like drug tests, contact highs, etc. Um, so just when we're talking about public consumption and safe consumption spaces, I just really, really want to make sure that we're not pushing, you know, outdated rhetoric on something like a contact high and a potential danger there when there isn't one. Um, yeah, that was it. Thank you. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, next, we have Eli, Greenbridge Consulting. Hey, all right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say on the, um, on the events, you know, I think the question of detaching consumption from sales on events, you know, the current problem that I think was alluded to was uh, legal consumption spaces, and uh, that is inherently different than sales at these events, right? So there's a way to get started using the alcohol model. Um, literally, you know, we did this in 2018 with the Lamoille County Sheriff's Department and the Town of Johnson went through this process step by step. EMTs, plans. So, um, you know, using the Department of Liquor Control templates really, um, and having some clear red lines. Like, hey, we don't want to see anybody consuming cannabis in the beer garden, right? Um, it's basic things like that. We were able to, with those people in law enforcement and public safety, have a comfortable scenario where there was consumption in you know a safe, regulated way where everyone was ID checked in 21 plus on private property. So um, sales and consumption, I think, 
are two things that need to be detached for the purposes of events. Uh, and that people have cannabis at the weddings already. Uh, we just need to tell them it's okay to smoke at their work. Preferably maybe direct them to where we would link them to rather than another place. Um, so being proactive on that, uh, I think is I think is big. Um, you know, as, as far as the, the fees thinking about the outdoor cultivation, you know, just for reference, you know, I know the Senate when they talked about this wanted to be competitive with Massachusetts. You know, it's 25 cents per square foot indoors and 12 and a half cents per square foot outdoors, right? So um, those were the initial standards for Massachusetts and we're still clearly way outside of that. Um, understand uh, the idea of going to per plant for, for outdoor cultivation. Um, you know, and would just suggest that uh, as far as social equity, I think the elephant in the room is still the question of the integrated licenses uh, with the market access that they have and considering if the need is to uh, raise this money for a cannabis, uh, the reinvestment fund, um, you know, the reinvestment fund is social equity. I would much rather see the vertical license be $500,000 uh, to subsidize the rest of this program and lower the licensing fees uh, than to see higher tax rates encourage the illicit market and then put this into some fund. Uh, that's then distributed by the state, which I personally do not have a, a ton of faith in, um, due to previous, uh, not you folks, uh, paradigms in regulating. So um, I think that's just something to, to consider when we're talking about social equity that it is very much a uh, foot on the scale already. Um, and that some restorative justice would be to let the integrated licenses, who we now know are all owned by multinational corporations that could theoretically afford it, uh, to let them subsidize a lot more of this so that we really can, you know, not be charging $50 per strain uh, for somebody to get set up. So um, I think there are other ways to go about raising money with things like fishing licenses. You know, we've talked about in the past for uh, out-of-state consumers, things that could be sold at general stores, uh, and that we need to find a way to get the burden off of these small producers um, and off of consumers that we have a chance to, to really compete here. So, uh, thank you for the chance to speak and uh, and the consideration. Thank you, Eli. Next is Graham. Hi, everybody. This is Graham Ewing, Street for Knox, um, policy director at Rural Vermont. Uh, I just wanted to say, first of all, I appreciate where you all have kind of in general on social equity. You know, our I'm also a member of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, as the members of the board know, and we fully support your recommendations in terms of those bullets related to ongoing funding for the, C the Cannabis Development Fund, the excise tax for reinvesting in communities as well. In terms of percentage, just I believe we recommended 20% of the excise tax. Um, I also wanted to elevate Eli's comments related to seeking appropriate support from the vertically integrated companies. Uh, in terms of On-site consumption, I think Eli and Amelia make really good points, and on-site consumption is different from sales and serve different purposes. And I think the members of the board, you all made point to mention the sort of fundamental disconnect between the reality of consumption in the state and the current regulations, their inequity in relationship, privilege to consume in general, the untenability of living here in tourists having legal access to places to consume. And what I'm hearing is that you're concerned about the culture of fear that's still associated with the plan. And because of that, you only feel comfortable starting with a temporary retail license for events. But I think my concern is that that, that doesn't really address the concerns related to resident first access. Access. Hi. 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 Sorry, Graham. Hold on one second. For consumption with a temporary retail event, it will remain legally inaccessible and likely unattractive unless affordable to purchase on one's own. Um, to most residents and tourists. In terms of the other retail licenses, the question of whether they be fully regulated as retail, you know, I think these are all very accessible models of retail. The farm gate, the, the example about the general store having its place. We have living examples. We have examples of licenses like this existing. They're more than broadly distributed with wealth and types of businesses. We have models for how they're differentiated. Um, you know, in terms of risk to use alcohol and tobacco and ammunition can only purchase at general stores and gas stations and groceries. And it's not that a lot of concerns around visibility and optics, perhaps years away from the risk in the landscape we're present in. Um, 
you know, in terms of the farm gate, you know, as a representing that cultural organization, I just want to, again, to say that I think there's some narratives that you're espousing here that just aren't grounded in, in reality and sort of concern that they keep coming up. That, you know, in terms of having, we're not talking about equal regulation between full retail and farm gate sales, for example, we're talking about equitable regulation. We're talking about very different types of sales. When you're only selling your own agricultural product, you're growing from products principally produced on your farm. Um, it's very different than selling products you're buying in constantly from, retail, from producers all around the state. Um, we have, in terms of the will it cannibalize traditional retail, which I think was the direct quote I heard, um, from an objective perspective, it makes no sense to fully. We have farm stands, farm stores, farmers markets, other examples of retail environments regulated very differently than full groceries. It has not cannibalized groceries. Um, I'd be happy to speak to retailers who feel like it, this would be a threat to them, but really we have examples throughout other not being a threat. Um, and I just appreciate that narrative um, sort of not being espoused um, and can be you know, pushed back against. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Graham. Next is Jesse Lynn. Hello, this is Jesse Lynn. Um, I have to do a little spiel. I apologize. I'm the pre president of the American Nurses Association, Vermont, as well as the director of the American Cannabis Nurses Association. My statements do not necessarily represent either organization. I'm a research nurse specializing in pain management and opioid use disorder in pregnancy and infancy withdrawal. So as you guys know, I tend to have feedback and comments. So I have a few, please. Thank you for listening and having these public comment sessions. Um, as far as delivery, I would ask that as you guys continue to hopefully be, continue the conversation and consider not having the unburden, the burden of taxes for patients at an adult use retail and allowing patients to not pay that tax and be able to shop at adult use retail. If that is not an option, to consider at least extending that option, possibly for delivery, so adult use can deliver to patients. Um, I would also like you guys to consider while you're talking about on-site consumption that at some of these licensed cannabis facilities, we will be employing patients and people who consume to help them get through their day and use cannabis as medicine. So if that can be part of the conversation, so licensed cannabis facilities allowing on-site consumption for patients and employees, I think is important to address. Um, I'd also like to second what Eli said. I was there with him, and I think we did a fabulous job talking to law enforcement officers and really keeping a very safe and respectful, organized event. So I will second and support anything we can do to work towards having those event permits. I would like to not think of that so much, though, differently than on-site consumption of alcohol. When we allow alcohol, we do not ask them to have an overnight plan to not be driving home. We understand that they are adults and they're making the decision and have the education to either keep themselves safe or to have a designated driver. I think that becomes an issue and a concern from that social equity aspect as far as having the finance to make that part of that mandated. I also have had many elderly folks reach out to me and ask for educational opportunities and events to partake and consume with somebody during the day and have the ability to sit there for hours and hang out and then hours later feel comfortable leaving and going home. So I would not want to also lose that opportunity for folks like that. Um, I would like to see if there's ever a possibility that you guys can consider when you're talking about all these fees, is there, and I could be totally wrong, is there any way you guys have any authority to allow sliding scale fees at different points for different applicants? And you know, at what point can you do that? When we look at the direct sale, I'm sorry, um, the, the licensing from you know a gas station or a store and parceling that out, I would encourage and, and like to advocate for you guys to be looking first at those direct sales. Let's have the farmers and the cultivators do that before we allow a little gas station or a store. And I'm thinking both from that educational standpoint, I would want to ensure that we have people who are bud tenders or people who are selling those products have more education than not. And I believe direct sales from a farm or a cultivator has a very different level of education, respect and understanding of the plant. So I would like to just advocate for that more so. Um, I think that is it. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Jesse Lynn. Next, we have Ben. 
Hi everyone, happy 2022. Uh, thank you all so much for, for this. Uh, I don't want to be too repetitive. I think that uh, Jesse and Graham uh, and other commenters have definitely addressed the fact that while the consumption options and event options that you all have discussed so far are really a phenomenal jumping off point, uh, it does not necessarily address all of the equity concerns. And you know, we have to wait to prove the success of the events first. I, I think we all will understand, but we will also continue to be aware of um, the, the audiences that are not yet served. Um, I have been working on a policy document that uh, I will circulate to some of these people who have been commenting for months and months uh, so that hopefully we can get some things in front of you for consideration for the 15th report. Um, and otherwise, I just want to thank you, uh, and particularly Julie, for, for bringing up the broadening of the delivery license yeah. options. I think that's really important for folks, especially uh, social equity folks that are looking to build a, a business that they can really stand on for more than just a five year exclusivity. So, thank you all so much. Thank you, Ben. Next, we have Mark. Hey, Mark. I've just got a couple things here. Um, hey, Brand David uh, team. Uh, happy New Year to all of you. Um, let's see. I want to just go back something something I think we missed in our recommendations that we sent over to you. Um, I'm, I don't think we caught it. I think it might have come up. And it was a little point of contention back in section 23 of Act 164, uh, Title 23-1202. Uh, and what it was is uh, the uh, consent of taking the temp to determine blood alcohol content uh, for the presence of, uh, you know what I'm talking about. It was it was pretty big on in. Um, um, the, uh, I think the negotiations that they were doing, what do you call it, the committee, conference, conference committee, and I think it slid out the gate at the end. This kind of goes to, um, part, partially goes to the conversation y'all were having earlier, just about nobody really being in a position to talk about this whole THC content. Um, it was in another, um, um, I think, looking at it from another perspective, that's just, you know, content within the product, but we know these tests aren't reliable and we know who they impact mostly. Um, they're probably going to be the folks that are disproportionately being stopped by law enforcement. And then we get into constitutionality. I don't even know how this is by the ACLU. So I'm just trying to figure out, uh, is there any plans, uh, are there any plans uh, to go in and get this addressed, uh, number one? And since this is a public comment, I'm not going to wait for that answer, but that's something that I'm not under. Um, the other thing is, is with, uh, um, and, there, and there's additional language that goes down there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to belabor it right now, but it, it's all connected. Uh, it goes into that policy. Uh, integrated license. Um, yeah, like Eli said, like others were saying, you know, the, the whole um, structure is outlined in 414. Um, so, we're still behind that. We supported it out of the gate. We, we don't, you know, you know, this entire process, and we continue to support the policy that's on the wall in house government operations, government operations that uh, lays out the strategy on exactly how to go about getting that done. Uh, so if you're, you ever happen to be looking for some language, it's still over there. Um, and uh, yeah, the. Um, I want to go to the, now to the report that we did offer you over on page 11, if you have it. Um, I'm just talk a little bit about um, some stuff on some racial equity as it pertains to some other things in uh, Act 62. Okay? That's um, um, Section 15, uh, the implementation of the medical cannabis registry. Um, at the time, this is, this is written, and I don't know whether or not it's, it's uh, oh, by the way, congratulations on inheriting that. You guys, that got dropped in your lap a few days ago. I, I understand the whole medical cannabis piece. 
Um, so there's the uh, med medical cannabis registry uh, and the regulation of, so what I'm looking at is, it's just, I'm not clear on the timelines and the steps whereby the medical cannabis registry and the, uh, the regulation of the cannabis dispensaries uh, that they begin to comport to uh, the principles and the standards and rules that are established by the CCB regarding equity. Um, so I mean, I'd love to catch somebody offline on that or maybe if there's a note or, or maybe you can come back with that because there, there, it sounds like there's supposed to be a convergence um, and we know, but I think most people understand that there's inherently an inequity of those um, entities operating in this market and it's hard to, um, to navigate. Um, so I'll go to the next one is, is substance uh, misuse. This is a pretty good size one. Uh, substance um, misuse and prevention. It was also in that report, and the reason why I'm bringing it up is, is just that I haven't heard a whole lot about it. It seems like, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you take and allocate 30% of this funding to something, uh, it seems that there'd be more conversation about it. It's a big old chunky change. This one. Um, and I think what we asked you to do, and I'm just reminding you, is, is that to give some consideration to the historic poor outcomes of this approach, uh, this whole substance abuse and misuse approach to black and brown communities as it pertains to much anything, to include tap tobacco. It, it just hasn't served our communities very well. Uh, so um, this, um, we're hoping that the program somehow or another can be branded and tailored in a way that's more culturally sensitive uh, that's, and, and maybe even administered by some black-led organizations to effectively benefit uh, these black and brown communities. We're talking cultural, cultural sensitivity in these areas um, because that message of just don't do it may not necessarily be the message that some of my communities really need to hear. I think there are other messages. Um, so let me see here. I think. Uh, let me go back again and talk a little bit about the recommendations to the um, to the legislature, and, and I, I know you're going to come back to this. And I know that everybody's trying to stay in lanes, but the whole thing about addressing systemic racism is that there are no lanes because there are, everything interconnects. And I see you're tiptoeing around 250, uh, which really needs to be addressed itself. And uh, knowing and understanding as a committee, as a as a board. Uh, as a, a well-seasoned assistant attorney general and ledge counsel, um, I think we also all know and understand uh, that there are things that are intrinsic in 250 that are problematic uh, in this particular market, uh, and that's because uh, it's what we're looking at is we're looking at a policy that was created over 50 years ago um, that has uh, you know disproportionate outcomes. Um, has delivered disproportionate outcomes consistently. I mean, and the only reason why anybody would say it's antidotal because nobody's been measuring it. But the bottom line is, is that uh, there are some things that need, I mean, why are we talking about one acre? Um, you know, just the just the language that we're using there, you know, indicates that we got some huge problems. So no, you're not here to fix that, but you are here to make recommendations to the legislature. And I hope you don't have blinders on when you make those recommendations. Is all I'm saying. I hope what you're doing is when you're making those recommendations, if you see something uh, that has something that, that there could be some uh, modifications made to uh, that are um, continuing to contribute to or perpetuate these dis disproportionate outcomes, that you would make those recommendations too, even though they don't primarily relate to the cannabis industry per se, if you know what I mean, to include Act 250. Because there's a there, there's a lot of work that needs to go in there, and again, um, uh, just dialing over to compliance and enforcement. Um, I, I want to again the reason why I'm bringing some of these out is is a combination of what I haven't you know some of the stuff I haven't heard and it's part, partially maybe because I haven't been on these calls, uh, and then the other piece is is that we, there's been somewhat of a communications breakdown if you know some of you know what I mean between us and, and the board as far as getting some clarity on exactly what you are recommending. Uh, so I may as well just take this time right now and make sure it's on the record. So with the compliance and enforcement, 
um, piece, um, you know, obviously our concern has been that just as in the illicit, illicit market and in, in, in just in enforcement in general, uh, there is a disproportionate disproportionate to the um, a um, disproportionate um, policing in our communities. Um, there, there's nothing to preclude that from happening happening in the tax and regulated market, and we really need to get some attention on that during, during this rollout. And I don't think I don't think we wait long to, to let that work itself out because that's not how we that's not how things work here. So um, that to include that that also includes, and this again, this is making recommendations that may not be primarily in your lane. But could be legislative recommendations, nonetheless, that could have a direct impact on this market, such as exceptions for home growers who are renters and how we deal with their landlords and so forth. Um, I will leave it there. I, I think I'll step it down. Uh, but um, you know, I'll come back maybe on Friday and give you some more because there's a couple of other things. But I'll just leave it there. Thanks for the time, and I hope y'all have a great afternoon. Thank you, Mark. Nellie, anyone else? Uh, no, and there are no phones joined currently. All right. Well, it's 4 o'clock, um, and we made it through the agenda, so I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone who joined.